So you said you were. You, you, All right. What games are you playing? Let's, let's just what start. am I playing? Yeah, what are you playing? What am I playing right now? Oh man, that's a that's. So, I've uh, I, I I love games. I play a lot of games. Uh, but uh, what I've been playing right, now, I still play. Uh, Do you hear that, ladies? Just put that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I I have this weird addiction to Clash of Clans right now, and uh, I've, I've been doing it for a long time, and I've. Uh, you start to. This is the. I, I started to play it because I wanted to see how what the what the fun loop was on that as a as a game maker, a game publisher, and I wanted to see what everybody was talking about. And that was one of the one of the few that's really really hooked me for a long time. Um, and it's just a daily grind, right? You know, kind of like it's a, it's, a, it's an MMO light, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really attracted to those kind of games. I was talking earlier. I have to I had to give up MMOs. So I, I, I have a sickness. It's called it's called being a fan. And uh, I play games. I love games. And it was one point years ago I was playing a game called City of Heroes that mm -hmm. I still yep. love. And uh, they uh, they nerfed uh, a class of character because of me. And I was friends with, with the devs, uh, and it was Jack Emmert that suggested that I even roll a Gravity Kinetic Controller. And uh, I, later on I was talking to some other devs and uh, and I was asking, trying to ask some questions like, hey, why would you, yeah, I know some changes happened. Why would this happen? They're like, yeah, well, there's this one player on, on this one server. It's one shard. And I'm like, well, which one? They're like, uh, the, you know, Atlas or whatever. And I'm like, that was me. There was no, I mean, I was the number one hero on that shard, right? I was, it was, you know, and I was, it's kind of ridiculous to talk about, right? Like, they're going to, it's one of the reasons why I stopped playing these games is because uh, you, it starts to affect your personality. You start to think like this is who you are, your mm -hmm. avatar, you know, you're like you're a god or some superhero because people are bowing down to you in the, if you walk through, uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, long story short, they were never going to write, you know, here lies Blue Lucifer on my epitaph. So uh, <laughs> my, my second son was born, I realized I'd missed the first four years of my oldest child's life and, <laughs> and, I, and I decided to give it up. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Ray and Dr. Greg uh, created... Uh, uh, the Star Wars, uh, the Old Republic, uh, and uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, and I'm like, ah, like this, and so uh, I played that just for a little while, just enough to know that I was going to be an obsession too, and, and quit. But but I like games. I like first person shooters, is what I dig. So my um, my boys like to. They still play TF2. They they kick mm -hmm. ass. I kind of stopped playing it. My skills were diminishing over time. I'm almost 49 years old, so I'm not like the Twitch player I used to be. Uh, and uh, but I like first-person shooters. Uh, the new Doom is coming out. I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I played the ton of Borderlands, which is the game that, that, that uh, a lot of people know me for. Uh, I put in uh, maybe I put in hundreds of hours uh, on, each, on Borderlands One and Borderlands Two before the game ever was, was ever even out, <clears throat> just for fun, just to play. And that's how we knew. Honestly, that's how I knew that that game was actually going to be something because uh, when when you see developers playing a game they've been working like you know 10 hours on that day and then they want to play it uh, when they're done working uh, just for fun then you have something special there we knew that of like with Serious Sam when I was at God Games uh, Max Payne was like that you know certainly Quake and, and all the, the Quake derivatives that uh, you know uh, and, and the, the mission packs and all that kind of stuff that was so obvious then because uh, it's kind of how I got in the industry you just go over and we would just play with the uh, guys or ritual guys and you know doing a lot of death matches and stuff and um, when you have that sort of thing, you know that's that's a great game. And there are games that, that we see like that today, you know, uh, um, where it just really, really pulls you in. There's there's some games I know that are in development right now that are really exciting, that, uh, that really appeal to me. I can't talk about those. I'm not going to reveal uh, these other folks' games. But, uh, you know, being able to talk about them with them and, and uh, the promise of, of what that's going to be is going to be fantastic. But the last game that I played, to answer the question, uh, the last game that I really, really, really loved and got obsessed over was Breath of the Wild, and uh, I'm a member of the right Academy now. as well, so I was able to vote for that for the game of the year and so on a couple of years ago, and uh, that still, to me, has left a lasting impression. And uh, uh, for those that have not played Breath of the Wild, shame on you. So. <laughs> Every question is going to get answered like that, so it's going to be a long day for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of <laughs> Guys, I'm going to go ahead and interrupt just for a second because I'm going to have Kevin sit down. Yes. We've got Kevin Sorbo here with us, so um, that way you guys have a chance. But that's why you were waving yeah. at me. All yeah, right, like you're trying to get me to shut up. Sure got it. Hey, why don't I let you guys do this thing and we'll uh, we'll pick my thing up later. No, no, you're, you're welcome to stay. We you want to do this to... together? Hi, I'm, I'm David. David. Kevin, nice yeah, pleasure to meet you as well. Uh, I'm sure you want him oh, by, yeah. by yourself, right? No, no, no. No, no he's perfect. All right, whatever. I hate to 
show you what, man. Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, hi. Yes, we met. Do we have, do we have a question for Dave or Kevin? What do you think about Branson so far? <laughs> you asking me? Both in or before? A couple times. Different, different things coming in for us. So last time was probably about two years ago. I don't run off. Yeah, I've got a documentary that was funded by a guy here, if you know that big house on top of the hill, Stephen Huff. Yeah. And uh, we, did a, we did a documentary in the life of John Lennox. John is a retired math professor from Oxford, England. We shot for three weeks in Oxford, two weeks in Israel. And we just debuted it at the NRB in Nashville. And, and uh, hopefully it comes out later this year. Tell so us a little bit about the documentary. He is uh, he's an apologist. And oh, yeah? he's debated uh, Hitchens, Dawkins, all the great atheists of the world, and it really documents his life. And uh, he kills them with kindness and humor, and uh, talks like Winnie the Pooh, his voice. is pretty cool. <laughs> so, but he's, a, he's a great guy, really, really great guy, real humble guy. And it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. It's pretty interesting. And um, it, it sold out. The, we almost almost had one screening in Nashville like, a week ago, just a day before the tornadoes hit there. And uh, it was sold out, so they threw another screening on her afterwards, which is kind of cool. No, I want to see it. It's pretty good. It's, I like documentaries, you know, so it's, it's pretty cool. So. so is that a subject that interested you? Did someone bring it to you? Oh, did yeah. Well, no, the, I, I did a movie called God's Not Dead. This movie was a $2 million budget, made $140 million. It's like one of those things that just exploded. And uh, we reference him a lot. I play the atheist college professor just tormenting this freshman who takes my, my philosophy first. And... Uh, uh, his name came up, so they came in and said, hey, since you played the antagonist, would, would you be interested in doing this? And he said, Israel for a couple weeks, Oxford three weeks, sure. I said, I'll go. I've never been before in either place, so it was pretty cool. Yeah, the only way I'd be able to go there is on a trip like that, too. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, it's just... <clears throat> well, nobody's... I'm not getting accepted to Oxford, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I, 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 I wouldn't get accepted either, trust me. <laughs> trust me. But it was beautiful. Yeah. There, just the one, yeah, the old building. I mean, that's... Uh, where they, they were the first place, Oxford University was the first to translate the Bible in English 400 and some years ago or something. So it was, it was just interesting. I love history, so what can I say? That's awesome. It's so wholesome, by the way. I mean, my God, that, 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 it's amazing. Now we're going to talk about like like video games, like you know, murder simulators. Well, you're speaking like that. Like you're you speaking know. my kids' language right now, my two boys. Like, my where do I go with that? Eight year olds <laughs> with me right now. So, you know. so actually, that, that leads me to a question because I know you both have kids. You being Hercules, you being a video game. Now, how do your kids feel about your career before them? Before them? Before they came along, and you know, does it? He doesn't look at you like we do when see Hercules. He looks at you and sees the man that. Yeah. You know, did he actually sat episodes. down and would, he watched every episode of Hercules um, a few years ago. So he, he got hooked on it. He was interested in it. But, you know, it's interesting because it's a whole new, I mean, there's parents now in their 30s, when I did the series all through my 30s, for seven years of my 30s, that now they were the 10-year-olds back then, and now they got kids. Mm -hmm. And so I go to these Comic-Cons, and I get the second wave yeah. now because their parents, you got to watch this show I grew up, and the kids are hooked on it. And, uh, you know, I mean, both shows are still, Andromeda too, both shows are mm -hmm. still in like 60 countries around the world. Yeah. And Hercules at its peak, by our third season, we passed Baywatch as the most watched show in the world in 176 countries. So last year I did eight Comic Cons and uh, we had three in a row in Europe. So I, we made a month trip out of it with my kids and my wife. And we, we did Vienna, Munich, and Belgium. And we just made a three week trip out of it. It was a blast. So it was just, you know. It was just fun for them to see Europe. I lived, I lived in Europe for three and a half years after college. I was going to just go spend three months with a girlfriend over there. And three months, <laughs> three and a half years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's like, okay, i got to get to L.A. eventually here because I'm, I'm from Minnesota originally, so I thought it was chilly here today. But you guys don't know what chilly cold is until you live there. But I, I live in Florida, and I just moved there last year. So we were 91 degrees when I left Tampa to fly here yesterday. Wow. You acclimatized pretty quickly. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> you were the heat. <laughs> Bring on global warming. I'm all for it. I was on an island in the Caribbean back in the 90s. And, oh, uh, really? Yeah, in Grand Cayman. And, uh, nice. Uh, My brothers were acclimatized because most people don't have you don't have air conditioning. Like finally, we got an air conditioning uh, unit for our apartment. But the only places that had air conditioning were like the grocery store and the theater and some restaurants, sure. right? 
and the hotels were not. So you just you get used to it. But then it, wintertime rolled around, and it got like down to 74, 73 degrees, and people pull out coats, and they're like, you're, you're you know, the teacher chatter, because you, <laughs> you acclimatize to it, it gets cold all you of do. a sudden. Yeah, I do. Sucks. And I shot Andromeda up in Vancouver, and you get in the winter months, and the crew still got, they got shorts on. Yeah. They're walking around, I go, might wear a long sleeve shirt. But they're just like, no, it's fine, man. It was 28 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> Well, to answer your question, my, my kids, uh, uh, I got two teenagers, they play games. It's, uh, it's pretty cool for them. They get a lot of free stuff, free computers and free equipment all the time and all the games and all that kind of stuff. And they have access to all, all the folks in the, in the industry if they want. My oldest is a programmer. He's been accepted to UTD and he's been wow. there. And, and uh, you know, he's got like, you know, uh, the, the CarMax of the world at his fingertips if he wants to have a question about what he's doing. But, um, <laughs> Uh, but he does it. He's 18 as well. Uh, 18, yeah, 15, and, yeah. and he, uh, but he, he likes to figure it out on his own. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, they they dig it. They, they get to do a lot of, 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 of cool things. But I, you know, it's it's kind of funny because um, I can see how they also kind of want to do the things on their own, and and I love that. You know, mm -hmm. the youngest one definitely is uh, his own person, and and uh, he's going his own way. But the oldest one is, is digging the video game scene. And, wants to actually be a part of it, which I'm trying to discourage him, <laughs> because if you really want to make money, go into the corporate, uh, you know, uh, sector or whatever for programming or uh, whatever, go to NASA or something like that, but, um, or robotics, but, but yeah, it's, it's been fun, you know, I, I grew up in this myself, my, my father was a comic book artist, I talk about this a lot, but uh, uh, he would host comic conventions, so back in the 70s, I was a kid, uh, hanging out in the room. I have heard of back then. Yeah, that was Rare, when it was first beginning, you know, yeah, yeah, and, and, uh, I think San Diego started with like three guys in a room. Yeah, it yep. was. You know. <laughs> I remember when it was just a few guys uh, and and uh, magical times, different times for sure. But uh, um, it was neat seeing my father uh, signing autographs. Uh, you know, fans coming up to him or or, uh, or whatever. And I just remember to, to to be in that doing that now by accident because I'm a generally a biz guy. Uh, that has fun doing voice up stuff. Uh, it's. Uh, it's fun for me, and it's fun, it's fun for my kids. Generational thing. You know. We well, brought that up, and watching your father, watching him get autograph stuff. My kids love following about ten feet behind me in airports because they love to see people. <laughs> right. Hey, was that? No. <laughs> Thankfully, that doesn't happen to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be able to drink in public if that happened to me a lot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I wanted to know about an incident that happened where you had um, some health issues back when you were doing Hercules. And um, you went, had some partial blindness and everything else. And can you tell us what exactly happened during that time? Um, I, it, I got a book out called True Strength. Actually, right. my follow-up book, True Faith, just came out a week ago. So I got both books here. And I'm doing a speaking event on those things as well. Um, I think that's Sunday, right? The 2 o'clock at the yep, well? Sunday at 2, yeah. And um, I was having all kinds of problems with my left arm. It was killing me. These fingers, these three fingers only, were numb and cold all the time. Couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, and this pain to my arm. But, you know, I was doing all my own stunts because I thought I was cool and strong. And, <laughs> and it was fun, you know. You the 30s. And, uh, yeah, but it was fun, you know. And side stunt guys make me look great anyway. But uh, uh, we finished season five. And I flew back to L.A. to do um, promotion of my first big movie, Call the Conqueror, mm -hmm. Universal. And... I get to L. I get to New York, and it was just like my arm was on fire. I said, "I get this checked out." So I went and saw a doctor back in L.A. My doctor he found a lump way up here. He thought he didn't tell me at that moment. He thought I, he thought I had cancer, but um, he wanted to do a biopsy on it. So I went to my chiropractor, and uh, as I'm laying on the table, I heard a voice in my head twice say, "Don't let him crack your neck." What's weird about that is he never cracked my neck in eight years because he knows I like my neck cracked. So I'm going. I'm arguing with this voice. Why is? What do you mean? Don't let him crack your neck. Boom, he cracks the neck. And that ended up being, it was an aneurysm. They had been spitting blood clots for months into this, cutting off this circulation of blood in this, these fingers. Oh, they're cold all the time. That opened up completely, sent hundreds down here, but three into my brain. So I uh, had three, three strokes. And uh, lucky to be alive, well, number one, lucky right. not being wheelchair the rest of my life, but I spent four months with my balance center, with the vision and speech, and uh, worked hard to get my speech back. So the 10% loss in both eyes. It took me four months to get my balance back and learn how to walk again, um, which was tough on my ego because you're playing the strongest man in the world. Now so I went to a guy that couldn't right. stand up anymore, looked like a big drunk. And uh, you wouldn't be able to tell. I, I know what still what repercussions I have with me, but people wouldn't be able to tell. So I've passed every physical exam ever. But you know, I had to drop out of another movie that I was going to start like two weeks after. 
that happened. They replaced uh, my role, uh, Patrick Swayze replaced that role. And then I um, went back to, to start season six, and I went from a 14-hour workday down to one hour day, because that's all I could really do, until we slowly built it up over months. But uh, they did a lot of stunt casting. You know, we had Bruce Campbell coming a lot more. Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm glad they kept it going, because it motivated me. It, you know, it, it gave me that light at the end of a very long, dark tunnel at my you know, time in my life. It was, it was brutal. It sucked. I said, I, I remember him joking, I wouldn't wish I good. I said, no, I'd give it on the Taliban. They can have it. They can have it. Gives you a new perspective on life. No, yeah, you know, yes. Oh, there's no question. Yeah. No question. I mean, um, it, uh, to get I became a lot more patient in a lot of ways and not as very driven. I'm very, I'm very strong willed. And I think that helped me as well to get past it. But uh, uh, priorities changed, you know. And I, was, I got married that year as well. You know, when kids come into my room, with no, you know, I got a little girl too, she's 14, but if I come back in my office, boom, yeah. I put the work down, let's talk. You know, I, I give them full attention, you know, instead of saying, I'm busy right now, I don't do that anymore. So. And after that, you still went on to do Andromeda? I did. Um, I was, Same I, amount I, of Well, we finished season six and seven, so I did another 44 episodes of Hercules mm -hmm. after the strokes, but we built it up. Um, if you're on a movie set, there's so much wasted time, you know. It really is. I mean, I was working 14-hour days. I was lifting to our, I was 2.30 back then. I'm 2.10 now. So I was lifting heavy. And uh, I was 18 hours door to door. That's just stupid. You know, so when I got Andromeda, I, actually, they were talking about doing season 8, eight 9, and 10. And I got a call from Angel Roddenberry. She says, my husband wrote a show back in 1969. And I think he would love you as the first captain. He created after Captain Kirk as Captain Dylan Hunt. I said, stop. I said, if you're offering me the role, I'm in right now. <laughs> I'm a huge Star Trek fan, the original series. Love the original series. And uh, Universal didn't care because they own the Sci-Fi Channel, too. So, I mean, that was all fine that I ended up doing that series as well. So I went straight from seven years in New Zealand to five years up in Vancouver, British Columbia. And um, had a blast. I mean, I, I loved doing that. So, But that, that what I said, 12 hours door to door. If you pick me at 6 in the morning, I'm home at 6. And it changed everything because yeah. that gave me six hours at least every day. Sometimes I finished by four or five, but my crew loved me because the crew up in Vancouver had been on um, X-Files. Mm -hmm. And David Duchovny was bitching and moaning and got to move down to L.A. So th they came to my show. And on most of our shows, if you don't know, you can start at 5 o'clock in the morning on Monday, but the call time by Friday is usually around 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And they're shooting until 8 the next morning. We wrapped every day by 6 seven o'clock at the latest. Maybe they had one more scene without me with other cast members afterwards. But every night they got to go home and Monday through Friday have dinner with their family. It's like, this is awesome. You know, there's this thing. They thought it was great. So job. And, and yeah, but there's, there's so just much waste of time. Yeah, yeah. I act like another A D in the set. What are we waiting for? You know? Just, <laughs> we're dicking around let's shoot. I, I whenever I work with a director and after three straight days, fourteen or fifteen hour days, I, I whisper in his ear, go, you know, Clint Eastwood shoots eight hour days and makes Academy Award winning movies, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Walk away. <laughs> it's true, they just get it going. I just directed uh, a movie last year and a movie the year before, and I got another one coming up this year. Hopefully, here in Branson, we're trying to raise money for it right now. I'm glad that you brought that up because yeah. that was one of the questions I wanted. So, can you talk about the, the Branson project? It's a heavy eight, eight hour day shoot. Um, you know what? No, that, it, you know, I, I keep it at 12 hours or less. Okay. I do. I mean, I, I, I definitely get moving. I'm probably about 10 to 11 hours no, normal. Um, but it's a heavy sc high school drama dealing with bullying. Um, there's a rape. I mean, it's, it's pretty heavy duty with dealing with it and stuff. And uh, we'll see. I mean, they haven't they, they haven't raised the money yet. We're still working on that, and, you know, crossing our fingers. But uh, I'm doing location scouting tomorrow morning. They sent me a bunch of pictures, so we're hoping it happens. But I got another movie already that I'm booked for. I'm playing um, in the Reagan movie. Dennis Quaid's playing Ronald Reagan. I'm playing his priest. Start filming that in June. And then I've got a, uh, a Western we're shooting after that up in Calgary. And then I've got a TV series that I'm shooting se September, October in L.A. How do you go about deciding what project you're going to do next? I give 20 pages on a script. If I like it, I'll keep looking at it. If I don't, I just say next. You know, I've got my own production company. Mm -hmm. I got the uh, Cerebral Family Film Studios. My wife and I run, and uh, we're in the process of getting a pretty big chunk of change to get the movies going. Because I, I like doing movies. We have so much negativity going on in the world, and hate, and anger, and divisiveness, and Hollywood puts out to me just so much crap that you know. 
I get I get stopped at airports all the time. It's really not Hercules or Andromeda. It's hey, God's not dead. Soul Silver, mm -hmm. what if? Abel's Field. Do you have any Let There Be yeah. Light? Do you have any yeah. like that coming out? Mm -hmm. I go. Well, you guys got to support it because trust me, studios, movie theaters don't care what they put in the movie theater. They just want to sell popcorn. All right. So, but if you if you have a movie that your your community goes into and says, hey, we really want to see this movie, um, and promise we'll fill it up, they'll bring it in. You know. So that's I'm, I'm trying to do more movies. Every movie's a faith-based movie. If you're an atheist, that's a damn strong faith to believe in nothing. You know. So I, I hate it when they call them faith movies. I just call them family-friendly movies. What I like to do, because they're not all the Kendrick brothers do really preach to the choir. You know, war room stuff like that. I don't want to preach to the choir. I want to do movies like Green Book and Blind Side, stuff like that. And that's my latest movie, Miracle in East Texas, which will be out. We're going to screen it here Sunday night at six o'clock at Grace Community Church. That was called. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what's great about this, it's myself, John Ratzenberger, Lou Gossett Jr., Tyler Maine. I met Tyler through the Comic-Con world. Do you know who that is? Uh, he's a WWF guy. I don't know who he was I either. I met him like five years ago. And these w, these wrestler guys get mile-long lines at these Comic-Cons. Uh, um, did, did he not play Sabretooth in the original? He played Sabretooth. Yeah, Sabretooth. Yeah. 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 was a part of uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween. Yeah, he's a great guy. And yeah. he does so good in this movie. It's a true story set in 1930. And uh, it's about two con men played by myself and John Ratzenberger. And they would woo widows out, out of fake oil wells um, <laughs> across, from, across Oklahoma and Texas. And they would sell 500% of the shares wherever they went. So they, oh, dry hole. Sorry, honey, we got to go, you know. So then they would go to the next town. Well, they get to Kilgore, Texas, and they strike oil. 1930. Largest oil find in the history of the world at that time. 500% of the sheriff. <laughs> they go to jail. <laughs> and while they're, waiting to, while they're waiting for sentencing, and walks a gentleman by the name of L.D. Hines in our movie, but in real life, that's H.L. Hunt. You know the Hunt family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Out from Texas. Uh, so he yeah, comes, right. he comes <laughs> he, this is how he became rich. Right on. Right on. He comes in, he says, boys, I'm going I'm to give you one deal and one deal only. He says, you know, you get a signed paper, and I get, I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay everybody you swindled, I'm going to make them all very wealthy. Of course, he made himself incredibly wealthy. And I said, well, well in the movie, like, what about us? We found oil. He goes, son, you get your freedom. Freedom ain't free. Yeah. <laughs> so, I had a brother on that was a judge in the Dallas area, and he was backed by the Hunt family for, uh, for political reasons. Well, his so, son yeah, said yeah, yeah. he bought the Kansas City Chiefs and they cornered the yeah. silver market back in the East. Yeah. But it's it's a true story, and it's it's film. This is the only city that we're showing this movie outside of a film festival before it comes in theaters in September. And um, so we've been doing film festivals with it, and it's been winning everything from best romantic comedy to best faith film to judges' favorite, best narratives. I love the fact that they can pigeonhole it because it's something for everything. Now, like I told you, like Blindside, right? If you're a person of faith, you kind of, ah, oh, that was a really good faith movie, like mm -hmm. Christian Piano. And the guy's there, and dude, that was a sports movie about that African American. The guy was a stud, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's how you look at it, you know? And, but I want to do movies that bring in the crowd that say, you know, wow, just a nice movie, period. I don't want, you know, I don't want. I was saying, I don't want to preach the choir. I want the choir to support it. But well, it's also interesting you brought up about what Hollywood is putting out because I, I just found out earlier this week. I guess Wednesday, our IMAX here in town is premiering a new faith-based film mm -hmm. called "I Still Believe." Okay, it's the first faith-based film that the IMAX has exhibited on their large screen. Seen that one? I heard something about that. One. Um, Shania Twain and yes. Gary Sinise. Gary Sinise. Mm -hmm. Gary's a good buddy of mm mine. -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Very first son. He just got diagnosed with cancer. His young son, Gary Sinise. So he's a good guy. Gary's a good guy. Uh, it does a lot for the vets. Oh my gosh, he's mm -hmm. been over there fifty times. Mm -hmm. He's kind of Dan Band to Iraq and Afghanistan and all that. Yeah. He's the he's he's our generation's Bob Hope, and he does it in mm -hmm. such a quiet way. Nobody gives the credit that he deserves. Lieutenant Dan. He doesn't care. I mean, you know. Yeah. Uh, with the company as big as IMAX, sort of saying, "Hey, look, we want to put this out because the yeah. movie actually opens on the 13th, and they're doing premieres sure. or special screenings on Wednesday, and Thursday." Okay. I mean, that's gotta bode well for, you know, those oh, faith-based sure. films. And even the trailer for the new flick, I watched, and yeah. if you hadn't told me that it was a faith-based film, yeah, I never would have. No, even... it's very funny. John Rasmer is hilarious in this movie. I gotta tell you, John. Lou Gossett Jr. plays himself as a 92-year-old man that recants the story. He plays the 8-year-old kid in the movie, so he, he comes in and sort of narrates. Oh, wow, that's acting. It's, a, he yeah, it's amazing acting. <laughs> it's amazing the digital de-aging, what they can do now. Now that, and you eight years old? <laughs> I believed it, and it's great. <laughs> but it's, uh, we shot up in Calgary and a beautiful ranch up there. It's funny, somebody asked me in another interview I was doing, they go, how can you shoot Texas in Calgary? And I said, 
Well, it's a 3,000 acre working ranch, and if Clint Eastwood could use it for Unforgiven, I can use it for my movie. Okay. <laughs> and they shot yeah. Lonesome Dove there, and they shot Revenant there, Leonardo DiCaprio's movie. And um, what was the other one they shot? Open, Open Range Kevin Costner. There's one other one they did. But they shot a lot of westerns up there. So I was like, okay. I'll use it. And you get a 35% tax credit, and our dollar's 25% stronger. So with small independent movie, it became a little bit bigger budget for us. Right. It's beautiful it's location. Oh, it's the amazing. Are fantastic. Well, you have to. I mean, Canada's just kicking it right now. And the biggest state in America is Georgia right now. Mm -hmm. There's more TV and movies out there than California. We're going to see South America starting to open up. Today. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. I know New Mexico's it's, it's doing. New Mexico's got a. I'm doing just no, I mean, like, like a week like South America there, so. continent is going to be opening up as well for like. like no, that's what I mean. Oh, yeah. With tax incentives. But yeah. that's what New Mexico's doing too. Though. Oh, right on. Yeah. They've got, a, they've got a big tax credit. So. Kevin, at what point did you get very public about your faith and what happened in regards to Hollywood at that point? Well, I've always been. I mean, it's not like I, I wear it on my sleeve or I go out. If somebody brings something on any movie set or TV set, I've been on, I didn't deny it or something. It was always there. But you just, you, know, you, you can see in the last 10, 15 years how just polarizing it's all become. You know, we sit there and say something bad about Muslims, they attack, they attack you and you get banned from Facebook. You, you know, all you're doing is saying the truth. And you say, you can, but you can bash Christians all you want. It's weird to me. I don't, I don't get it. It's not Christians flying planes in the buildings, but, you know, sorry, it's the peaceful religion apparently. But it's it's weird to me, and then um, I've always been a conservative. I voted for Reagan the first time I could vote for anybody. My dad was beside himself. You know, <laughs> you know he, they, they were hardcore uh, Hubert Humphrey and Ma Walter Mondale Democrats. You know, but I remember back then when I voted in 1980, I said, "Dad, I think this Carter guy is going down as one of the worst presidents we have ever had." And I was pretty much right. There's another guy to talk to him, but uh, <laughs> but no, but it's, it's just weird to me. It's just weird that. Uh, Hollywood screams for tolerance, and it's a one-way street. Right. I don't care if someone has a different point of view. I don't get mad about it and get angry. I mean, you see these these pro-abortion people just violent and attacking. You're like going, dude, can't you just have a conversation about it? You know, it's it's weird. I I, I don't know. I just I don't have that in me where I get get up in a soapbox and just start condemning and say people should die if they don't believe the way I do. You know, it's just weird. But this is the world we're living in now. I just look at those people are just incredibly unhappy with their lives, I think. It's these trolls at 2 in the morning, just, you should die, hope your family dies, you know. But none of those people walk up to me in public and say anything. They should come up and get in my face in public, but they don't. <laughs> I'm offering you to. <laughs> they can fight with Hercules, that's civil, what you want. I'd have a real conversation about it, you know. <coughs> what, what, where's, where are your stats? Where are your facts? Where's your truth, you know? And, they don't want that. We just have a don't come around stuff. here with your facts and Don't give me that. Don't give me none of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Kevin, do you feel like that has cost you some roles? Oh, it's cost me everything in Hollywood, sure. If it wasn't for independent movies, I wouldn't have a career. My agent after ICM, after many 20 years and them making a boatload of money on me, said, see you later. My manager said the same thing. But we had a good party. We differed in our points of view, but she said, I can't get you in the door. You know, so what are you gonna do? Tolerance, <laughs> freedom of speech. For oh, for you, but not for okay. Yeah, so yeah, it's, if it wasn't for Indies, I, I would have no career right now. It, it's amazing to me. You know, I've golfed with some of these other actors that are screened for you know the benefits of socialism. I just laugh. I go, dude, you're worth four hundred million dollars. You can afford to be a socialist. I mean, it's just interesting. <laughs> it, the hypocrisy drives me crazy. That's what drives me nuts. You know, they may show up in the Grammys or the Emmys in a, in a Prius, but trust me, they fly private planes and they got the Cadillac SUV at home and they got, you know, they got, it's just, it's such a show that it's, uh, it's, it, I, I go crazy with that, you know, do as I say, but not, you know, not what I do, you know. I know what's best for you little peasants out there. How to live. <laughs> it's ridiculous. There's my sofa. <laughs> He's just like everybody else. He pays somebody to put his pants on one leg at a time, right? <laughs> <laughs> like a cowbell. <laughs> Chris Rewalkin. When I put mine on, I make gold records. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> Kevin, on your, on your resume, too, uh, this might be a little bit of a link between you and David in the gaming world. You got some work in your career uh, uh, relative to God of War, the franchise. I did God of War three and God of War Requiem, mm -hmm. and um, I did I've done a couple, and um, 
the conduits. There's probably about four or five. I remember doing this Gen Con. You done Gen Con? Yeah, yeah. Um, I figured you had, but I mean, I never, Indianapolis. And they could give a crap about getting eight by 10 of Hercules or Andromeda. They come up, as, I must have signed 500 of these God of Wars and stuff. You know? Dude, this was awesome. Sorry I killed you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Corey Barlog, the, uh, the director of that series, is, uh, is absolutely he's a, he's a fantastic uh, uh, game developer. He's done a really, really good job. And, and the, the whole team. It's yeah. impressive when you look at yeah. these things. Yeah. All these games. I mean, you get a view everywhere. You know, I'm going. The last one. There's more money. There's more money in that than there's in movies. You know, and I know. games. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As he smiles. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. <laughs> Sometimes better acting. You gotta catch oh, up. I wouldn't you say catch, that. you got to catch a flight on your personal plane. Huh? Oh, <laughs> I, I take two planes. I've always wanted to do more of those. I've always wanted to do more of those voices, you know. Yeah. But you know, it's, some of those frats are sort of hard to get into too. You know, it's like voiceover world. I've done some voiceover stuff, but it's it's hard to break in there. I came so close on Mercedes. That's so weird. Get, to with John Hamm. Like, like I couldn't break into doing voice acting roles. You, know, you should have done it like me. Oh, I, I just uh, made my way uh, to the top, you know, worked, worked myself from the bottom to the top, and then just hired myself for whatever role I wanted. There you go. <laughs> I love you that. Have the producer and the producer's that. girlfriend all at the same time. Ah. So, yeah, <laughs> there you go. That's funny. Yeah, it's amazing, because, uh, David, I think you even said, too, because we, we talked, and the uh, cool thing about it is the same thing with, with movies versus games now. There's kind of that, that hype, and people are starting to, to turn away from the studios to a certain extent. Mm. It's that independence, it's that indie level, where you can really tap into your creativity. You don't have to go through 20 or 30 people to get your vision intact. And there's that indie allure in gaming now, and the indie projects are starting to surpass the big boys. And that's, and that's pretty cool to see. It, it, it is nice to see that uh, there's so many independent uh, developers uh, that are getting recognition uh, for their game uh, and also for, for their studio. Um, we want to see more of that. It's been difficult in the last number of years to actually find these independent games. The, the, we have a problem of discoverability yeah. uh, in the game industry. There's so many video games mm -hmm. that come out every year, and there's only a few that you actually hear about. You know, you might know of the, even if you're really in the games, you might only know of like the, the top 20 to 30 games that have been released this year, but there's been thousands that have been released this year, right? And so when you're, if you're looking, if you're an older person like me who doesn't have the, the twitch skills anymore and, and uh, wants to play a single player game that I can pause, walk away from, come back to, and I realize I'm not dead right now, nobody's looted all my stuff, right? So, uh, you know, it's that, I like to get like, comfortable uh, game, game playing, whatever. Uh, it's hard to find those games, if you, especially if, if uh, all your friends, you know, all my 49 year old friends aren't talking about a particular game. How am I going to find the thing? So uh, that's been an issue, but, but uh, lately there's, I think there's been some solutions there uh, where uh, the way that, that games are even marketed and, and that we put, uh, we position games in front of the customer has, has changed too. And we're seeing a lot more uh, influencers that are, that are affecting that. And if you like somebody, if you find somebody that you like to watch, especially the younger generation these days, and, you know, it'd be like, it'd be like uh, oh, uh, kids today are watching people watch Hercules, right? You know, like, know. I'm just going to watch them watch the game, uh, watch the show, and I'll figure out what show <laughs> I want to watch from, from watching them watch a show, you know. And, Why don't you and, just play it yourself? I know. <laughs> I, 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 for the longest time, I was like, that's really interesting. That's, huh, if, you, if you're making money, that, I have a buddy mm -hmm. of mine, I have a friend of mine that made a game called Minecraft. I'm sure you've heard so, of that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and and one of his he has a home at the, in, in Beverly Hills and uh, and and he's a he's a wonderful host and, and uh, uh, he's a he's a wonderful lovely person and uh, he has this amazing home at the, the at the top of uh, Beverly Hills and um, there's a guy in his neighborhood that uh, plays Minecraft and uh, he doesn't have the seventy five million dollar mansion but he's got like a six million dollar mansion or whatever. <laughs> In the same neighborhood, and and that, and he's a guy that didn't create anything other than the persona on, which which is great, and I'm not taking anything away, but it's amazing to me as a person who would make and publish games that like that's a that's a business. More power to you. I love it. And what's what's also wonderful about that is that he gets more people exposed to games like Minecraft or other games out there than someone. What's and, Minecraft make a day? I've heard all kinds of rumors. Oh, I know what it. 
I, I wouldn't even know now. Does um, he want to fund independent movies? He's on permanent vacation. That's all he really cares about. <laughs> what, what you mentioned is exposure. I mean, that's what independent movies have a hard time. I mean, my movie came out a little over a year ago, Let to Be Late. We opened against Thor Ragnarok. So we opened up against a $300 million movie on my $2.3 million movie. I have a million dollars of P&A. They have $150 million of P&A to promote the movie. We still, I did 130 radio and TV interviews three weeks leading up to it. Busting my ass. We opened up number two against that movie, First Green Average. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult because they have a lot of money. This guy here that's funding cool. this, this documentary I did, I, I explained that to him. He goes, he goes, but yeah, but we're not Star Wars. And I said, no, you don't understand. It isn't, Star if you bill it, they will come. It doesn't work that way. And he said, in Star Wars, even though the world knows Star Wars, they still spent $150 million promoting it. So, now, do you get it, what I'm saying to you? So, it's, you have to, you need to put people, we all have short-term memories. So, it's got to be bang, 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 every football game. Oh, there's a Star Wars movie coming out. You know, you got to have something mm -hmm. out there every time. Kevin, I mean, are there, are there any execs out there and what blows my mind is that somebody out there in Hollywood doesn't take notice of the fact that you go and you shoot a movie 12 million dollars and you're making 140 what blows my mind is, is that somebody out there is not awake to be able to see that and go you know what there's a market here we need to start paying attention yeah. I mean do you have anybody on the industry there's, side that says you know what they, we notice this they, they notice it there's yeah. an ideology which is really stupid look when let there be like did as well as that opening weekend I got a call right away from Netflix yeah so I went to their offices there in, in, in Hollywood and met with them three times over four weeks and said, look, we want to open up an inspirational division. They said, well, great. I got some wonderful movies. You know? So I sent them scripts. I sent them a couple TV series. I sent them a TV series that's awesome. And it's not touched by an angel because that's not going to fly anymore in today's world. It's, it's punched by an angel, okay? I mean, it's, it's got a heavy edge to it. You know, it's not, and the main character is an agnostic. He's not a guy that's going around. He's not walking on water. He's not clearing, you know. And, um, they hem and they haw about it. I said, guys, it's called show business, not show show. Yeah. I said, why? You're, there's 80 million households out there that want this kind of. Why wouldn't you just? You can laugh at the Christians, call them all the names you want, but laugh all the way to the bank. But it's weird. It's a weird battle with these people. It's, it. They, everybody's afraid. Everybody's afraid. I got to fly out to L.A. on Monday. I'm doing a one-day event. Um, they're doing this spoof on Bernie Sanders, and it's bloody hilarious. And they had a hard time getting the three generations of, of Bernie Sanders. They wanted the 22-year-old and the 40-year-old and the present-day one. And I said, oh, I can't. I'll wreck, I'll wreck my career. It, the script's hilarious. I'm playing George Washington. I wake up and he wakes up, sees me next to him in a dream. You know? And, and I sit there and try to talk some sense into the guy about what he's doing. It's, it's only a three-page scene. It's friends of mine that are doing it. And I, I read the script and I said, they've been shooting nine days already. They say it's going great. But... Don't touch that. But if you want to make fun of, you know, Reagan, then go for it. You know, it's weird to me. It's like make fun of both sides. Yeah. Yeah. They're both fun to make fun of. I mean, there's such morons on both sides. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I mean, look, when I saw the elections coming in the last line when Trump against Hillary, I said, with 340 million people, this is the best we can do. <laughs> 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 I mean, seriously. You know, I said, this is the okay. This is America. You know. <laughs> But uh, it, it's like I said, this is where we're at. So you mentioned Star Wars. You mentioned TV. That leads me around to everyone being in love with nostalgia and reboots sure. and remixes um, or whatever you want to call it, revivals. Mm -hmm. Any anybody ask you about doing the? Let's do another series of Hercules. Let's do too old to that show now, man. No, <laughs> oh, no, no, too much. no, Well, we always kind of joked about it. Michael Hurst and I played Eolus. We always joked about it. You know, we'll be on a show 20 years later with big beer bellies. We'll be in rocking chairs. And say, Hercules, a Hydra. And we were going, ah, we'll just talk about the time I beat a Hydra. We weren't even. <laughs> it's a cut show. I would uh, watch that. I would we'll totally do a, We'll do a Gilligan that. fade, you know. And, <laughs> two old men in rocking chairs. <laughs> yeah, drinking beer. Um, I what would, a tailgate, actually. Well, the Andromeda is what's still kind of bums me out because we were the number one show in first run syndication uh, halfway through season five the Tribune company which owns the of Chicago went bankrupt so they said you get to finish the last 11 episodes but then the show's going to be done we're in bankruptcy court so they had to freeze everything so that was a bump because we had two more years on our contracts that's 44 more episodes people got sort of screwed on and I love doing that show we had such a good time doing it but you know it is what it is Herc was the same thing we had a great time doing it and we we spun off a lot of copycat shows. I mean, Xena was a spin-off in our third year, and that same year, 
other people try to copy with Conan and Sinbad and Tarzan and Robin Hood and Sheena and all that stuff. You know, and in our fifth season, we spun up Young Hercules, which didn't do very well in Canada for two years. But that was a 20-year-old Ryan Gosling playing me as a teenager. That was his first big break. That was before See he became Ryan yeah, yeah. Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> I bumped into my one-year-old dude. When you put me in one of your movies, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you break, man. You got two years in New Zealand for crying out loud. Because he was devastated when they canceled. I remember he called me up. We did, went to have lunch. I met with him before he flew back to the States. I said, Ryan, you're 21. You're good at it. You're going to do fine. He's done okay. It's more spin-offs of video games. Uh, Nintendo does, does a good job of stuff like that. Yeah, you think there would be. Nobody else does a whole lot of that, yeah. It'd be good. You know, like Mork and Mindy came from uh, from Happy Days. From it's Happy a, Days. It's a, so Laverne was there, and was, Shirley. Was yeah, there a weird... Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like, you know, Happy, Laverne and Shirley. A weird... Happy, a weird but, yeah, was there a weird spin-off from Hercules that, like, that was... Something that was totally out of the ordinary was like you know went from like uh, yeah. uh, some like well they tried to do something thing. they tried to do something they did a Cleopatra twenty five twenty five okay and, there you uh, go. and Bruce <laughs> Campbell did Jack of all trades but they both got canned after a year so I don't know what happened there but anyway that's what it, it was Cleopatra twenty five twenty yeah twenty five twenty five yeah that's, there's your there's your Mork. yeah <laughs> they had three they had three those hot galactic chicks you know. <laughs> Gina Torres went on to do Firefly for 13 episodes, and she was on Suits, was it Suits? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Lawrence Fishburne and her, I think they got divorced, but they were married for a long time. And Lawrence was, when she came down to Hercules, she had like six episodes. Uh, he would fly over from Australia, because he was doing The Matrix at that time. And he would hang on the set, and I go, dude. You're boring for you hanging on the set. You're already on the set all day over there. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh man, it's cool to hang out here. You're like, we like your show. It's cool. I go, okay, thanks. You know, so it's kind of neat to hang out with Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah. I like his acting. I like, I like him. It's good. Kevin, with your with your uh, family based films and your projects with your with your independent studio, is there a topic that you have not yet filmed mm. or shot that you would like to that you would like to do? A topic that you haven't really done yet on on film. It's a good question. I mean, they're, 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 we do have a series that I really want to get done. I don't get too far into it right now, but it's, we would shoot it in South Africa. We've got the ranch, the 3,000 acre ranch. It's got the big five animals on it. It's based on a true story, but I, I would love to do this. It's, it's sort of, I guess I could call it a harder edge, Little House on the Prairie. All right. You know, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. We're just, you know, it's, but like I said, the independent films, it's tough to get them funded. I meet these guys, you know, I do a lot of charity golf events. I just was golfing in Tampa, at Archie Griffin, I don't know if people remember mm -hmm. Archie Griffin, two-time yeah. Heisman winner mm -hmm. at Ohio State, and he hosted it and stuff, and I golf these, you know, very wealthy guys, and you sit there and you find out one guy gives $10 million to this guy's campaign as president. I said, well, the guy didn't go anywhere. What did that $10 million get you? I said, $10 million bucks, I can make three amazing movies that will be out there forever, affecting people in a positive way. I mean, it's weird that they're willing to throw that much money at these guys, and not and th this happens to all these people, you know. And you're going, I, I don't get it. Why don't you want to affect the culture in a positive way through movies? Because Walt Disney said back in the '50s, movies will and do influence people, and it certainly influenced the youth, and that's what it's doing, you know. So um, I'm hoping, you know, but th th that's I'd like to do one more series. Um, I would like to do it in New Zealand and then retire down to New Zealand. I tell you, I love New Zealand. It's amazing. I had seven years down there. It was, it was fantastic. It's just a beautiful country, great people, great food, just great everything. It's just 5,000 people in, you know, North and South Island combined. That's a little bigger than California. Five million in the whole country, you know? <laughs> It's like, okay. There's 10 million in it's L.A. County alone. Oh, oh, a cup of sugar. Where do you live? I live in Texas. Where about? Austin. Okay, I've been down there a number of times. I've shot, I shot in Ron Rock, shot a movie in Ron Rock. Oh, yeah? Right Abel's right Field, like modern day Cannon Abel. Really good little movie. Right on. I shot in Dallas and Fort Worth. Yeah, I'm moving back to Dallas in a few months. I got a, I got a home up there that. that uh, I love Dallas. I've spent enough time there, man. I, get, I had buddies play football at SMU. And I've been, right on. Uh, back when SMU still had a football team. They are, yeah. No, they're pretty good right now. Are they? They, okay, they had the gay and the death stupid. sentence okay. for a long yeah, time. Yeah. They, they had back when Eric Dickerson. Yeah, I did one of the last, right. well, last guys, uh, Bruce Van Durbin, played on yeah. that team. No, they, the last couple of years they're built up. There, right so. on, right on. Texas football. <laughs> Texas uh, I, got, I got some buddies of mine, really good friends of mine. Their cousin just became the coach for the Dallas Cowboys. So uh, some, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, and I, I know, I know Mike's daughter. It's a great uh, stadium. Uh, oh yeah, we got to go on the. Uh, my wife used to work for Roger Staubach years ago, and and we used to go. Uh, his uh, uh, suite at Texas Stadium, 
And it was about the, the size at the old one. It was yeah. about the size, a little bit smaller than this room, about this wide, and and, and made sure where that uh, the, this coffee table starts, and he gets to the wall right over there. The new one, uh, we got to go to the first uh, homecoming game uh, at the new stadium, the Jerry World, and uh, yeah, we were guests of uh, my, my wife and I were guests of uh, Mars M and M uh, and Seven Eleven, and their suite was giant. It had like a 17, 20 foot bar inside with like. You know, I mean, the, and, and Rogers, don't get me wrong, it was nice Texas Stadium, but like the cool thing was it was like a mini fridge and there was like a shrimp bowl or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this had stadium seating inside the, the, the yeah. suite. And, uh, wow. and and the Cowboys uh, from the 90s were coming in, Emmett Smith and his wife, sure. uh, Ed, to, Ed Jones was Ed's, coming Ed's in. Ed's a good buddy. Uh, yeah, he's yeah. coming in, and, yeah. and he's, he, well, ask him then, what the first yeah. time that he saw the suites, sure. uh, and they're coming in with their jaws are dropping to the floor. Yeah. Uh, Tony Dorsett was like, they would have loved to have played, uh, oh, yeah. you know, at a right. stadium like that. It was amazing. And, well, and the thing is, you couldn't get your eyes off the screen. No, you can't even you watch just, the game. You, you can't look at this. It's, it's, you it's, see it's, a 60-yard <laughs> high definition. I, I, go, I go back to Minnesota. Minnesota's new stadium is amazing, too. Yeah? It's yeah. fantastic. Are they pumping uh, sound in there, too? Oh, yeah. On that one? Okay. <laughs> but they they need an indoor stadium. By November, it's not football anymore. Fair enough. It's ice bowl. But I'm going back next year. I'm invited to do, they have a celebrity local guy come back every year and eat home game to blow the big Viking horn and brings out the Viking Norwegian ship, you know, and the players run out with the fire coming out of the dragon's mouth, and so it would be kind of cool. Well, I'd invite you to a Dallas game, uh, it's but, fun. but i got to get the hook up first, so we're going to sit up there. <laughs> Kevin, David, uh, both of you in your spare time, uh, I'll start with you, Kevin, but uh, you and I were talking about uh, your, your love of golf, mm -hmm. awesome sport, love golf myself. Um, I just played already today. Did you really? Where'd you play? Payne's to open up the new one. Payne's, Payne's, uh, you got to play at Payne's Valley? Payne's Valley. Only nice. 13 holes. Only 13 holes open right now. It was so, a little chilly, but it was, we went out, my son and I went out and played. So it beg, begs the question, all the golf that you play, yeah. what has been your favorite course to be on? There's so many good courses. That's not fair, because it's, it's easy to give a top 10. Um, Royal Doorknock in Scotland's amazing. I put that up there in my top 10. Uh, Pebble Beach, of course. Spyglass, all this. I just did a Pebble Beach Spyglass tournament up there. In fact, Two years ago, I played in the first tee, which is the Champions Tour version of the 18 tee. And they, they just do two courses. They do Poppy Hills and, and uh, Pebble Beach. And my first day on the Friday was with Vijay Singh, who's won a number of majors. And we got to the eighth hole, 185 yards. I jarred it for hole in one. Oh. <laughs> They give me okay. nothing. They give me a flag. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Where's the car?" Wow! Oh. But I videotaped on the way in. I videotaped on the way in, uh, and a guy videotapes it for me as we walk up. We look at there's the ball in the hole, and I pick it up and I walk around. BJ, look at hole in one. What do you think, buddy? It's a great shot. It's a great shot. Where are you? Oh, you're in the sand trap. All right, buddy. I'll wait, <laughs> I'll wait for you over here. <laughs> How many holes in one has he had? I'll get one. Well, I've had seven. I've had no more kidding. than him. I've had Jeez. seven. Jeez. I got one of the Rocco Mediate in Hawaii during the. Um, the Honda, the first tournament of the year they played, yeah. the plantation course there in Maui. I, I, like, I was always happy when I could just get it past the window. There you go. That's one thing you see driving through here. My son, I've been in for my son said, How many putt putt places do they got? <laughs> they got one here. Oh, is that they got one right here. You just go out the door over yeah. here. There's yeah. a putt putt green. Yeah, it's right there. I go, Obviously, they do very well. <laughs> you know, <they're> everywhere. <laughs> David, for you, uh, when you're not uh, working on games, you're not developing, what do you do in your spare time for fun? <laughs> Play them. Yeah, I, you know, uh, what I do is I do is what I do for fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I love what I do. Uh, it, it, I wake up in the morning and I get excited about uh, about the stuff I've got going on. Uh, I just recently took a year off after launching Bendy and the Ink Machine. Uh, I, I got a new hip a few months ago, and uh, so I was dealing with that. And uh, I'm doing some stuff now I can't talk about. But uh, it's so exciting that every time I do talk about it, uh, you get the, the hair on my arm starts to stand up. Um, I've got uh, a thing that I'll talk a little bit about it, but it's, um, it's, it's a little bit of a paradigm shift uh, in uh, technology and AI and machine learning. So um, there's, uh, there's, there's certainly a lot of applications uh, in video games uh, for it, uh, but there's applications in every industry for it as well. And, and uh, it's, um, Really, really exciting. In fact, uh, yeah, I, I should probably just leave it at that. There, there'll be some things coming out in the near future uh, that will involve this. Uh, just remember Kaiju Factory, and that's all. <laughs> so, have you uh, have you had an opportunity in your time as well to uh, play a little bit of Media Molecules Dreams? And if you have, you know what? I know those folks over there, and I have not had a chance to play it yet. But I loved it, absolutely loved 
uh, uh, Little Big Planet, and uh, so much. I also voted for that for Game of the Year. And let me tell, share a little bit about Little Big Planet, which I loved. Uh, and one of the things that allowed me to communicate with my son. Uh, my, my boys are on the spectrum, and uh, my oldest son um, uh, was a late talker, if you will. And uh, he, uh, he didn't. His way of communicating was a little bit different, but he played. And today, he's, I mean, he's, he's a physicist programmer at 18 years old, and, and a lot of that was him learning uh, with, uh, with the engine of the, the, the world that Media Molecule created with Little Big Planet. But what the, the thing you that. You created that? Huh? You created that? No, 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 no. Man, I, I'm just <laughs> a huge <laughs> fan of it. No. Yeah. <laughs> just a huge fan. My kids play that. Yeah. We're talking about like what I'd like to do in spare time and different. Right. But, uh, uh, but but the uh, the media uh, media molecules uh, that particular game, which was really interesting about it, is because my son couldn't express emotion oh, or use language at the time. He was around five years old, and uh, I noticed that when he was uh, really sad or or, or, uh, or he would like to like down one or down two or then do three or he would do up 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 or up 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 you know and then left or you would do it basically. And I figured it out. It was. Telling me his emotions through the sack boy, mm. because you can you can hit uh, there's there's fear there's happiness there's sadness uh, and uh, uh, there was another one but uh, anyway uh, it locked this was like 13 years ago right uh, but uh, it allowed me to it was un unlocking uh, his uh, his brain a little bit and uh, that was really really cool I'd never seen a video game do something quite like that so you know it, it shows that there's there's a power in, in video games to educate uh, to uh, to heal. To uh, uh, also to entertain, and and uh, we focus a lot on the entertainment, uh, but uh, not always focus on the other parts too. That, uh, that are, are are helping uh, kids these days, or children, or even adults, uh, to relate to the world around them. And, uh, um, in fact, there's a there's a company called PolyUp right now that I'm just gonna I, I don't have anything to do with PolyUp at all, but uh, they do a program where. Uh, Allows kids say uh, to create machines within a virtual machine, and uh, they're uh, giving kids tools to to learn how to program, to how to, to build uh, uh, robotics and stuff like that, all through uh, the internet. And uh, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, and, and once somebody gets on it, they they uh, it's a it's a fun educational tool, right? You know, and and uh, I'd like to see more stuff like that. But uh, I don't know what your original question was. I just started talking. So. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Which is kind of fun because I'm a lot bigger than both of them physically, as well as my ship was thousands of years in it. So I'd say you realize my ship could totally kick your ass, and I can both ki kick both your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I told them both that. I told them both that. What's wow. hilarious to me? just walk away? Because that's curious. Shatner, Shatner's. I like Shatner. He's, Shatner's great. I've done. I mean, here as you know, as a kid growing up watching the reruns of the original right. Star Trek series. And then now I go to his house and watch Monday Night Football games. You know, it's just it just cracks. Me I got to meet the original cast of Star Trek when I was a kid. Uh, really? Going to conventions, right. yeah, in, in the green room. Uh, wow. You know, because uh, Dad was doing stuff too, and so uh, yeah, it was cool. Sure. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, I'm at a convention, and uh, oh, thank you. And I bump into Perfect. Walter Koenig, and uh, and I'm like, hey man, uh, we met, uh, you know, back in uh, 1978. <laughs> He's like, I remember you, and I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> I had hair then. I had hair. Uh, totally different look. But uh, but yeah, it's weird to bump into these folks when you're it, when you were it, a fan it, as a kid. It, you're watching the show, exactly. you know. Yeah. And that's why I kind of get it when people come to the table that never met me in person. Now they just kind of you know and they sort of freak out a little bit. And uh, I remember when I was actually doing the series because it's gone ten months a year in New Zealand. So I only did Comic Cons when we were just starting to kind of grow in the '90s. And I would do maybe one or two during a hiatus. And that was a whole different thing to me because we're sort of isolated down in New Zealand. And uh, you get out there, I remember one time in Chicago, this woman came up and she just fainted. Just went down on the ground, you know? And you get these fans with these crazy, wacky letters and stuff like that, man. I mean, when I got married, I got hate mail from women. I hope mean, people watch the show now, you know? I go, well, did you think we'd actually meet and get married one day? Or, really? You know, it's like... 
it's, it's it comes a human from the condition. word fanatics, doesn't it? It's a human condition <laughs> to see a face uh, over and over and over again and become familiar with it. No and question. Then, yeah, because you're in their bedroom and their living room, right, and you see yeah. all the time. And uh, I know little. I mean, I was at I was at a um, I was at a Planet Hollywood in Chicago. Not Chicago. This was in, no in in Vegas. And there's three generations. There's four generations. There's a great grandmother, the grandmother, the, then the mother, then the daughter. And it's like 94 years old down to nine, down to four. And I always remember this because the the little four year old, she was so cute and she was so tiny. I, I reached across the table and she put her little hands on my 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 cheeks and she said, "You're my hero." And it broke my heart. And then her 94 year old great grandmother grabs my cheek like this. She goes, "Us older people think you're a fox too." <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Made my day right there. I, I can't done. Imagine, I can't done. imagine being recognized in public uh, right now. I love being unrecognizable because I know anybody that actually knows who I am. It's just because I own money. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can just speaking of which, <laughs> so so almost the same question for you with the craze of the Fortnite and your Apexes and the other humongous games that are out now. What is your take on? What you loved as a kid versus what's really popular right now. Well, because I swear uh, to God, I saw Ninja on television the other day and I was blown away. What? All right, so I, you know, I grew up with video games. I remember Pong. I remember Space War, the first, the first uh, arcade game, putting a quarter in, uh, uh, standing on a milk crate, playing with my father <laughs> at a at a comic convention. Actually, uh, mm -hmm. uh, video games uh, back in the seventies. That was actually part of the draw of a comic convention. There were no arcades yet right. at all. We had Pong. That was and, a big uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I, I am a, a undefeated at Giant Pong. There is a, a Giant <laughs> Pong at uh, the uh, Video Game History Museum in Frisco, Texas. And I beat, let's see, I beat uh, uh, Palmer Lucky from Oculus, uh, uh, Vince uh, Zampella, uh, who the creator of Apex, uh, uh, Respawn, uh, 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 I beat uh, uh, Pendulette, and uh, uh, let's see, who else? Oh, Cliff Blazinski. Freaking bit beat him as well. Undefeated, giant pong. I'm just saying, like, just <laughs> everybody knows now. Okay? <laughs> so, is uh, that an open challenge then? I feel like we need so to find Yeah, absolutely. I know him pretty well, too. From, I, well, I have my home in Vegas during those years out yeah. of the country. So, it's California, even though I was gone 10 months here, still wanted to take state tax. I said, that's just stupid. I'm gone. So, I Moved to the Monte Carlo of Henderson, Nevada, outside of Vegas, and I got to be. They used to have a show, cable show. Yeah. And I used to, I went to the show one time, uh, the, and I uh, totally wrecked their <laughs> trip. <laughs> I didn't mean to, but uh, I wasn't supposed to be open this open this mayonnaise jar, and I just broke it. Well, you're gonna give it to you know. Give it I to think uh, that was very apropos, right? Yeah. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> I don't know what to do these hands. <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, pen, pen, I, yeah, I, I unfor unfortunately know way too many magicians. Um, there's like a lot of them <laughs> out there. Well, those guys are good, though. Their show's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what were we talking about? I forgot. Your take on the current view oh, yeah, of gaming with Apex to win and the question. Fortnite. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Fortnite Wait, is let, we, I think we established that I was the uh, grand champion of Pong, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was it. Um, you know, I, I, I came from the era of skill test games, and one of my favorite games is Robotron. Uh, 2084, uh, and uh, um, you know the guy that invented that. He also uh, created uh, uh, Defender and Stargate. Uh, Eugene Jarvis is his name, and uh, one of two people that I ever wanted to hunt a leg. And uh, I, it's, it's funny. I'm gonna go off a little <laughs> tangent here. I, uh, I, I was at the uh, Academy Awards, and uh, he got the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, a few years ago. Uh, and uh, our table was up at the stage too, and it was next. Uh, Hours and after the show, uh, I had spoken to him on the phone a few times mm -hmm. up in the Chicago area and I, I, uh, Texas, but he'd never met, he'd never met face to face. And so after the show, I went up to him and, and I was like, "Hey, uh, 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 Eugene, it's David Eddings. We spoke on the phone a few times." And I just started, I just started fan out. And I, and I, growing up with, around celebrities, uh, you know, my grandparents uh, being musicians and songwriters and stuff like that. There's you know, you know how to act. People are just normal people, but, but there are always those people that just really mean something to you, right? And this guy created some of my favorite entertainment that I spent hours, hours, and hours, and, and, and you know, hundreds of dollars on, as a, you know, all three quarters, right? Just pumping them in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I weirded him out. I mean, I really weirded him out. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, he, uh, He's like, he was holding a drink, and uh, <laughs> and I, I, I figuratively humped his leg, and, and he just looked at me, 
and he did a sidestep where he just like, sidestep and <laughs> slid his other foot and then sidestep slid his other foot all the way away. And I'm just like standing there, like, all right. So, uh, so flash forward to us. Uh, I'm at, a, I'm at a, an event and a buddy of mine, a couple of buddies of mine are throwing a, a yacht party at a Comic Con. Uh, Cliff and uh, Justin Roy Cliff Lizinski, Justin Roiland, and a guy that does uh, Gravity Falls. Uh, uh, and and it, Weird Al is on the sure. And so um, I get a chance to, to talk to him. He's photobombing every, all the different pictures and stuff like that. He's a really, really nice guy. And we're on the starboard side, just the two of us at one point, and I, and I, 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 I say, you know what? I, I hate to do this. Uh, we're in a social situation, I said, but, you know, you're, you're like the only, the second person that I, the world that I would ever want to, you know, hump their leg. And I told him the story about Eugene Jarvis, and I was like, you know, and I told him how weirded him out and everything like that. And... Uh, and you know, Weird Al, such a nice guy. He's like, "Do you want to have my leg?" <laughs> <laughs> he, he held his, he put his leg out. <laughs> and, uh, and I hung his leg. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I teabagged his kneecap. You know, and, and, uh, it, was, it was awkward. I'm not going to kid you. It was, uh, you know, for both of us. But, uh, uh, he'll remember it forever. Uh, you know, <laughs> so uh, anyway. <laughs> but uh, the video games thing. Uh, look, I don't. Fortnite was would be right up my alley 20 years ago, uh, and my friends, uh, uh, a lot of my friends work on the game and so on. And uh, Apex, I lo love that game. Uh, I would love to love that game. It's hard for me to play those kind of games. They're just too old. I, I can't do it anymore, right? And be competitive. And that's the problem is I'd be too competitive, and I right. just hate my. You know, it would, it would be depressing for me, right? Uh, so uh, I see what's going on though, and I love it. it it's it's a, it's building community, you know. Uh, by you know, I was going to relate to my kids, but it gives them power. Uh, at, at, you know, it shows my youngest one shows leadership skills. He'll have like a faction of of, uh, of, of folks, you know, and he's like he's 11 years old and had like a faction of 600 people in, in like a just cause game or whatever. Um, whatever you know, people find their entertainment and. and uh, in this day and age, when uh, uh, it's it's difficult to find your group, you can find your group these days. And, and if that's through video games, then fantastic. I will say this about Fortnite. Um, I did put a dance in Fortnite. I uh, at last E3, I was hanging out with uh, with some dudes, and, and uh, I asked them why they didn't have a particular dance. And uh, it was Pride Month, and I said, uh, "It's Pride Month. How come you don't have the gayest dance in the world?" <laughs> And he goes, uh, what's the gayest dance in the world? And I'm like, well, you've never seen it. He goes, how do you know? I'm like, well, because I invented it. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to do it for you. Uh, you'll have to find it in the game. But uh, <laughs> I said, uh, I said uh, he goes, well, show me. And so I showed it to him, and it's absolutely the gayest dance in the world. And, and, and I know that. So because humping weird as, as a, as a, Yeah. <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a very confident heterosexual man who will order two umbrellas in his drink, uh, I, I uh, you know, I know exactly what, you know, if I, like, whatever, what, you know, it's, I could do that. I could make that gay. So uh, he was so impressed with it, he had me do it again a second time, and he filmed it on his phone. And I was explaining that to somebody, and I actually just performed for them. And I said, I don't know when it's going to come in. Maybe maybe it'll come out, uh, you know, Gay Pride Month. And uh, he goes, no, it's already in there. He goes, I saw my son. Had that on his <laughs> I'm like, all right, awesome. I made it. So I uh, didn't get paid for it, just like voice acting. I just do that stuff for free. Just throw, throw dances in for it, you know, for free. So. Um, look, I, I, entertainment, we all, we all uh, want to be entertained. We want to find, we find our time where we want to spend that time. And I love that I get to contribute in, uh, to people's uh, enjoyment. And, and that is fun for me, you know, and coming to a show like this, coming to the conventions, it's fun because I get to actually see, you know, video games, it's different, uh, I think, you know, like if you're an actor, uh, you get reaction from uh, the, on the set, you, you can go to uh, a premiere or something and mm -hmm. you can see, you can hear the audience reaction. It's difficult with video games, you, you know, you only get the hate mail, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. Screw you and all this kind of stuff. and, and um, and every now and then you get something that you know, but sales, the sales numbers is really what the what the fan mail is. Sure. You know, that's where you see that okay, yeah. it's it's selling, so that's good. But um, getting past the business of it, I mean, you you have to make money, otherwise you can't continue to create the entertainment. But uh, uh, it's really neat to connect with people and to see how something is important to them or how it got them through a, a, a particular era of time. Or how it helped them meet somebody, maybe a spouse or a best friend. Yeah. Uh, you know, those are those are moments that are very human, 
moments that, that we can all relate to and to be able to, yeah. to get that through a video game and to actually reach through, if you will, the, the, the game itself and to connect is special. And, and when I come to a show like this, you know, it's one thing to, to be Hercules, right? And you get, you get the adoration of, of, of being Hercules. I make a, 300 people worked on a game. I get unearned adoration. It's who knows what they really loved about the video game, but I'm the one that's here. And so they're going to tell me how much, you know, and I, I represent all of that. And so, Just shake your head. Yeah. So, yeah, well, you, you do. And, you, know, you, you, you know, I remind myself that there's 300 people that also were not. I tell, you know, it's not just me. And, uh, but, but you have to be careful to, because, uh, you know, uh, you get, if you're, if, if you let it, you're, uh, it can, you know, your ego can run away with stuff like that yeah, because sure. it's not, it's not the real world, you know, it's, it's all, it's a concentration of people that really love what you do and, and the rest of the world doesn't give a shit, <laughs> so, you know, sure. um, but, uh, but it is fun to be able to connect with, with the folks that, that, that want to consume the entertainment and I know it sounds like a like marketing speaker or something like that, but that's, that's really what it is. We, we create, we want to entertain, we want people to be affected by it, whether they're happy about it or whether it makes them think and, and yep. uh, you know, become introspective about something, would change, maybe change their life for the better, you know, yep. or, or they just become addicted to it and they, you know, <laughs> and it's like those South Park and you see the guys that are playing a, you know, World of Warcraft, that happens too, so uh, we try to do things for good and not for evil and even with entertainment we want, like what Nintendo does, it's like, you know, hey, go outside and play a little bit sometimes, too, so, yeah. hey, did y'all invite it? Did they invite you to do LARPing by chance? I thought that would be really cool. I would pay like a like like a what? Like a <laughs> to LARP with yeah with Kevin Sorbo, right? <laughs> you know what LARP is? I have no idea. Live action role playing. Oh really? Yeah, and so you can like actually sword fight, and they have a bunch of swords out here and chest plates and stuff like that. Oh my god! No, yeah, no, don't you want to do that? <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, totally I, did, I did enough with other actors who thought they could do their own stunts. And they yeah. Couldn't. yeah. Well, these these all so, have like they're like nerf swords. Let me fight this stunt guy. Yeah, they're all nerf swords, <laughs> but it, it's a fantasy, right? And oh, sure. To actually be able to. Yeah. I mean, it's not your fantasy. Everybody else is. <laughs> <laughs> no, can't talk you into it. No. I mean, that's how you fund your movies, Kevin. Is you, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, he has a point. That's a <laughs> Fifty dollars a shot. We can get the lease. Oh, you'll do at least you have two million dollars, please. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, what have you taken off of, off your sets? What have I taken off my sets? I remember correctly, you th I think you said you had your staff. I've got, drama. I've got, I've got pretty much a prop from every episode that Hercules and Andromeda. Wow. So I could have my own little museum going there. Um, one of the coolest things was actually one of the first. We did five two-hour movies before it became yes. a series, and Anthony Quinn played Zeus. Got a year with Anthony Quinn. It was just unbelievable for me. Uh, initially, they wanted Charlton Heston, so that was the hair. And the, that, I'm a big Heston fan. So we went to his house to meet him in L.A., and he said, you know, Kevin, I, just, I can't do this because uh, I'm just not funny. <laughs> just, and, 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 and Quinn just embraced it, and we had such a good time with him. But uh, there was there was this, there was this um, compass that they made out of this egg, and it's just a really cool thing. And I still, it's in my office. I got that thing in the Apple. The first episode I directed was called The Apple. And that one sits in my office as well. And The Apple dealt with uh, Aphrodite. It's the first time, yeah. I, it's the first time I directed and I got to cast Alexander Tidings. We went on to do about 20 episodes of Herc. And, and uh, how we introduced her was that Michael Hers, Eolus is fishing. Uh, next to this old man, he's got like 400 fish and he hasn't caught anything yet. And all of a sudden he catches them and starts dragging them into the water. He looks at the old man, see, huh, huh? <laughs> he's going to drag them in. Ends up being this large clamshell. And uh, it's Aphrodite that was in there that opens up and she starts, she starts windsurfing with this giant clam shell. And at the inauguration shot of her, she's very large chested. We went, I put the camera right down <laughs> as she's coming up. So <laughs> for, for, for a show on TV, it was pretty <laughs> We had Corey Everson, six time Miss Olympia on the show too. And uh, we showed probably, I would say 90% of her butt. Really? Oh yeah, it was quite an outfit. From the top to the bottom. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But I, I mean, we did a lot of ad libbing on the show, so there's a scene where I get covered. This whole house collapses on top of me, and she helps dig me out. I'm all groggy from, you know, concussed from getting up. And so I told, when I was directing an episode, I told the camera guys, I said, "Now we're, I'm going to ad lib this line with her." And when we finished that line, just slowly pan down. So she she helps me up. I got my arm around her, and I'm all groggy. And she said, Herc, I get a doctor. No, I can't go to the hospital. 
And, and she goes, no, you have to go, but, but. She goes, there's no buts about it, Herc. And then it cut down. <laughs> so um, a lot of that stuff we threw in there. We, just, we, would, we, would, we, would, we would just make Ad-libbing stuff. It. Well, there's a thing that's got like 20 million hits that everybody asks me at comic Cons. When I, as a sovereign, the alter ego of Hercules, I yell out disappointed. And people think, if you go online, Hercules doesn't Woo, want you'll see it. I love it. <laughs> people think I that it. I misread, that I, the direction was, read this one line in a disappointed way. Uh-uh. I thought of Kevin Klein on A Fish Called Wanda. Because he says it three times. They've never seen that movie. It's such a great movie. So I just went, disappointed! I just yelled it out, and they just kept it in. Because I said, wait a minute, this isn't my world. <laughs> and, I just, and I just thought and yelled it out. And I love the fact that it's got like 20 million hits now. It's been growing. <laughs> You know? And I people do cameo and stuff. Like I say, could you, you know, my brother, my brother, uh, he 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 quit his job. He shouldn't quit his job. Could you say you're disappointed? <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, when these, when the Branson Con folks announced that you were coming, yeah. I walked out of the radio station. I said, I hope that we will not be disappointed. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm so glad you people put it, it on their phone. I love it. It's great. It's like the wife calls, disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> A, a living reaction I love for it. the rest of your life. I love it's it. Really it's fine. It's fine. People say, what's your favorite of all the roles you've done? Well, I say, well, Hercules. Without Hercules, they wouldn't have had all those other things following. It's as simple as that. And it was a great show to be part of, and we laughed every day. I wish they would have filmed behind the scenes completely and cut that into a show for one hour and then showed the final, because we had so much we, ridiculous on that set, the stuff that went on. And uh, actors would come down from the States and just loved it because they couldn't believe how loose we were. Yeah. And we kept the set loose. And my crew went on. Yeah. Peter Jackson came on the set. He's two, three times a year. Every year, because all through the 90s, he was writing Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. He took 90% of my crew. They went on to win Academy Awards. I mean, the stunt guys and Nyla Dixon did of our costumes. She won Best mm-hmm. Wardrobe. And, uh, every, and it's amazing. Ben Cook is a 19-year-old stunt guy when he started in the series back in 93. He's been Daniel Craig's body double, stunt double on every James Bond movie now. Just amazing. Little, you know. And of course, the Weta Group, where they had office, their office was this big when we started. Now they own half of Wellington down there. And, yeah. You know. I had a buddy of mine that was uh, offered a job. He's, a, he's an animator, and he was offered a job uh, for Weta. And this was, mm. this was right before they were doing Lord of the Rings. And he's like, I don't know. And, and he didn't do it. And he's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly. a long gig, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Taking himself now. Yeah. I got two series with those guys right now. Richard down there right now. I'm hoping to get off the ground. One's uh, one's called Stuffed. It's uh, it's a sort of Muppet show, and it's really the Muppets on crack is what it is. <laughs> and we're hoping to get off the ground. The other one's called Janitors, which is the 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 entire world is as it is to us, but unbelie- un- you know below miles below. There's a whole world down there, people living and you know creatures that interact and with with humans but it's a, a strange race down there so we're hoping it's a weird to, thing to call called janitors sorry that's <laughs> you know, I, hope, I, hope we, I hope we get this thing made I hope they want to get it but you know we're lucky you know you're looking at 80 to 100 million dollars easy you know it's kind of, yeah it's going to be more popular now than it ever was because the happy time murders came out and it had its mm-hmm. own niche audience and then peter jackson of course one movie that he probably wants to keep in the vault and at least doesn't talk about that much is he had a little film called meet the feebles do you guys ever hear yep. about that one sure yeah yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Fraggle Rock was was big too. So, yeah, cool. there's there's a market for that. And Kevin, like, obviously you had plenty of interaction with uh, with Lucy Lawless. Do you have a favorite moment uh, working with Lucy? She did about four different characters prior to getting the role of Zena. There actually was another woman who got that role. Really? Yeah. And then. Um, Shelly Long didn't work out. She. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um. Um. So, no, I'm, I'm just saying, it's, uh, how do I say it's going to be in tape right now? Um, <laughs> there, she's married to the executive producer of Hercules now. And so both of their marriages divorced when that came together. So it's an interesting story behind all that. But the reality is, the woman that had the role originally, very voluptuous, very sexy, Raquel Welch type. But it worked out better. Because Lucy, you need some more athletic in that role. Mm-hmm. And she's a good tomboy. Um, there was, in the second season, she played this woman that they make me go uh, blind through a kiss she gives me. And I remember, and I was always very, very nice. And I said, look, what do you want to do with this kiss? I don't want to make it comfortable for you. And, you know, no tongue. There's no tongue, she says. <laughs> 
first take, she sticks her tongue so far. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what happened to no tongue? She goes, ah, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not complaining. Wait, but was that the reaction that they caught on camera? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. I looked at the director and said, we need, we need one more take. <laughs> I, mean, I, like, I kept trying to pull that and doing the voice acting stuff, but nobody, nobody <laughs> was going for it. Yeah, it's a realistic sound. Yeah, like. <laughs> but uh, no, I thought it was uh, that, that part was that part was pretty funny. But there, there was a lot of we had so many so many stupid things happen on set. We're just so great. I mean, we started a lot of people's careers on the show too. I mean, Lucy Lucy Liu mm -hmm. yeah. was in one of the first seasons yeah. of, of Hercules as well, and she, she kicked by Catherine Bell. Six months later, she got on on uh, Jag, yeah. you know. So I, I always call it. Should I get commission for that? <laughs> <laughs> Something maybe for. for but uh, but it was uh, it, it, we had just. It, I said the laughs every day on the set were amazing. I, I miss that because that was more than anything else. It was just the camaraderie on the set. Because you're working long days, and the and the extras starting out were untrained really by the end of seven seasons. I mean, these guys were family, and you know, you knew everybody's name and. Uh, the last, very last day of filming, the very last, it was weird for me when George Lyle, our first AD, yelled out that was the last ever episode of Hercules. And I walked out and I just broke down. I couldn't get it out. Because you're there with more than your family. Yeah. Right. You know, you really are. I mean, it's, it's like bartenders and, and uh, makeup artists, you know, they get to know you better than anybody else, you know. So every day you're in, in, the, in that chair talking with the, all the ladies in the hair and makeup trailer, and they, it's, it's, it ends up being just a fun thing to do, you know. There you go.